All right, without any further ado, we're going to go to our first story, and that is a, a, a little bit different um, from the other stories that you'll hear today. We've got David Sackett, who is working with Growth Farms, as he said, and he's uh, got a different point of view, so it'll be interesting to have a look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is David Sackett and uh, my main role these days is working with growth farms. I guess the majority of our farms tend to be in medium to high rainfall areas and so our mixed farms we tend to sort of prefer to stay a little bit east rather than west because we think we just believe rainfall is so important. So what do we look for when we go looking for a farm for a client? We, we look at some of the key issues of uh, getting the scale right, so we want to have a viable economic unit. And that's sort of maybe 20,000 DSCs of sheep, maybe two to 3,000, 4,000 hectares of crop. And, and that might sound large, but what that does is allow us to structure it to get our labour efficiency right, to get our machinery right. If you're 600 mil plus, you can get 10 to 12 DSC to the hectare. That actually makes it quite competitive with cropping. Um, whereas if you go west into the 450, 400 mil rainfall environments, really cropping is is usually better, more volatile, extremely volatile. But the livestock carrying capacity drops off so quickly that livestock are actually hard to compete in that in that environment. So we like the 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 more eastern areas, and that means we can have a true mixed farm yes. in that we can have roughly half and half sheep sheep to cropping. And the reason we don't have many cattle is that we can't make the numbers work. They're just not as profitable. Really what we want to then do is identify the, identify the best value farm we can for them. You've got two levels of production to look at. One is what's it doing now? So how productive is it now? But the second really important part of that is what's it going to do in the future? And we often will look at farms and see that we can get 30, 40% productivity gain over a number of years. Probably more so in livestock because livestock tend, there's tend to be more scope for that. Um, but, but also we can see it in cropping with better rotations and loosening the system and things which are nothing, no rocket science. The first thing we sit down and do is, is a plan that takes out usually five years. And so that gives us a picture of what the business is gonna look like over the long term. It's not, a, it's not precise because we know it's gonna vary, but at least you can get a sense of where you're going and where you wanna go. And then as things don't pan out the way you expect, you can at least see the implications against your plan. Most of our investors are around for the long term, so they want to know what the business is going to perform long term, but they want to know the upside and the downside. And all those decisions about, in, about where we put our working capital on a farm are really important because you've got a whole heap of choices. And so you can look at on-farm storage, you can look at plant and equipment, you can look at livestock and improved genetics and laneways, all those sort of things. And basically what we do is go through and say, well, which are the most important? Takes, you know, 100 bucks a hectare out of your overheads if you avoid that plant and machinery ownership. People are really important, obviously, in making it happen. You can buy the best farm, but if you, if you don't have good staff, it's just a disaster. The benefits of mixed farming are huge, in the, and basically the key thing is the complementarity between the enterprises. You know, the fact that you can you can graze winter wheats, you can use lucerne for nitrogen supply, and you've got weed control options. There's those synergies, which are large, and they're hard to quantify, but they are real, and they're substantial. So that's the first thing. The second thing is about risk. You can sort of move a little bit more toward cropping or a bit more to livestock. You can go 60-40, 50-50 without too much drama. Now, we're not a big advocate of, of doing that because when you make the decision to do it, by the time you actually reap the reward, often the prices have changed some, to something different. So we tend to choose an optimum system and stick with that over the long term unless there is a very good reason to change. Um, but also the... Uh, the livestock or the sheep enterprise and the cropping enterprise have different risk profiles. The sheep are a stabiliser in the system and that's really important. Um, and in times of low prices and tough years, you'll still usually get something out of your sheep or you'll break even your cropping. You're just ripping up cash. I think the challenge for the farmers is to ensure that productivity goes up, not just production. So that if you're producing more, you're actually making more. Because over time, the... The cropping side has done very, very well with 2 to 3% per annum gains in productivity 
the sheep sector, particularly the wool sector, has some real challenges. Productivity gains are mostly incremental. So what we've got to do is keep focusing on the incremental ones, the one or two percents here and there, the, making sure our genetic gain is good, making sure that we're up to date with, with cultivars in crops. And what we tend to be is not on the first wave of new technology. We're not the first one out there with a new idea, experimenting with it, fiddling around with it. And so we'll tend to come along on the second wave once it's proven up and once the risk is taken out of it and once people can see that, yeah, that actually does work and it fits into a mixed farming system. Because the real challenge often in mixed systems is to actually think it, think it all through and say, well, how's, how does it affect my livestock side of things and how does it affect my cropping side of things and what happens when I put it back together? All those sort of things are really important. Thank you, David. As I said, I have a feeling that David's going to come from a slightly uh, different angle to some of our producers today. And if you haven't guessed or you don't know David, I think uh, he's an economic rationalist. And there's not a lot of emotion in the decisions that David makes around these sorts of choices. And when I said that to David this morning, he said, of course there's not emotion. You can't use emotion in your decisions. But Unfortunately, I, I think it is a big part of, of what people do. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here with my mic and I encourage you to ask questions of, of David and later in the day that we can, we, we'll share those questions along the panel. So, hands up anyone who has a question. While I come down and search for someone with a question, I, I think you said a number of interesting things, David. What I'm particularly interested in... Is it all about rainfall? Is it all about numbers? What role does interest and skill play when you're determining that enterprise mix that you bring to the table with an existing farming system? Yeah, obviously it pay, pays, plays a major role because if you're passionate about it, you'll obviously do it better. Um, I guess in, to some extent we're in the position that we have investors who say, uh, find me a farm or tell me what I should run on that farm and it, to some extent it takes the passion out of the decision and then we go and find the people who are passionate about it to make it happen. Um, but if you're in a family farm business, I think passion is a key thing because if, if you're passionate about it, you, you'll live, breathe it and, and be, determined, be determined to make it work much better. Okay, thanks David. Any questions? Richard Hayes, New South Wales DPI Wagga. Uh, David, I was interested in your comment on um, cattle, can't make cattle work. I, I just wanted to explore that a bit. What is it about cattle that aren't economic um, in, in the particular systems that you're interested in? Well, I think it's in a lot of systems, unfortunately. Um, and that's... Um, so why, why can't we get them to work? Um, the one big plus for cattle is that they're low cost. You know, they have a low labour requirement. You don't have to shear them and all that sort of makes life a lot easier. Um, the problem is they just don't generate enough income. And uh, no matter what you do on the cost side, you can't get your cost side down low enough to get the margin up high enough because the income isn't there. Um, and obviously there's a difference between cattle trading and cattle breeding. Cattle, cattle breeding tends to be lower and more stable. Um, cattle trading, and Vicky might want to comment later, but... It, uh, our experience is that cattle trading can be quite profitable but can be uh, disastrously unprofitable as well. So, I mean, we, if our obligation is to people who, who have bought these businesses and want the business. Most people want a financial return. They're not totally focused on that. They don't want to run the farm down and do all those sort of things. But every time we do the numbers, we just cannot generate the same level of profit from cattle that we can from sheep. So the only reason we'll have them on the place is that we've got no alternative, that they're the next best, op uh, last resort. And uh, the sort of situation might be where we have uh, a predominantly grazing farm and we put 20% of cattle on there just for, say, worm control, to give us some, some 
clean pastures because wall to wall sheep, it's hard to make it work. Um, so that's the only time the cattle get a look in, really. Ted Wolf, uh, Graham Centre, and to you, David. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned that uh, there's the rocky ridges and the, you know, the wet gullies and everything like that. That really, uh, you can only grow uh, livestock on those. You, yep. you can't crop them. When Growth Farms Australia chooses investors and properties, um, do you deliberately aim for country that is capable of doing both, both cropping and livestock, and reject those areas, those properties that have, let's say, 30% non-arable, or are you more flexible than that? Um, thanks, Ted. Um, we're flexible because we look for value, and so and so you can get value with a whole heap of rocky ridges and no cropping country. And, um, or you can get value with farms that are predominantly cropping country. Now, we're, in a, we're probably in a position of a bit of a luxury in that we don't have a family farm. We're not tied to it for a whole heap of reasons. But I don't, I don't think there's one answer to that. Um, I, I think um, the value of a farm is determined by what it produces and, um, and, and what it costs to buy. They're the two things. And so we, we're not particularly wedded to one particular view or the other. Having said that, you know, a lot of our, a lot of our farms that we manage in southwestern New South Wales are mixed farms. Um, but, you know, we've got one, one farm for a, for a client at um, Kulak, and it's got the most horrendous, rocky, horrible, unusable hills. Um, and you think, and heaps of people walk past it when they, when they wouldn't buy it. But it also has fantastic creek flats and, and undulating country, which was poorly run down and had huge, has huge potential for productivity gains. So, sure, there was a whole heap of rubbish on there, but there was a whole heap of good stuff that was people didn't see. So, uh, we're not one size fits all. It's just a, on the quality of the opportunity. Thanks, David. You made an interesting comment earlier about the productivity opportunities and gains in livestock, that there's been great gains in cropping, yep. but incremental gains in livestock. What's driving that and, and, and what are the issues there in livestock in getting those gains? Um, I think it's a particular issue in the sheep sector. The beef sector's had quite reasonable productivity gains over the last 20 or 30 years on the back of BTEC and stuff happening in Northern Australia. Um, the cropping industry has an outstanding record of, you know, sort of two, two and a half percent per annum productivity gain. The sheep sector is about 0.8. And, uh, and it's hard to split them between those, but given that the last 20 or 30 years have been dominated by merino sheep, then uh, it's really a merino sheep issue. Why has it happened? Um, I think the key reason is that for wool growers and potentially the wool growers who have been influential in decision making in the last 20 or 30 years have had life too easy and they haven't had to focus on productivity gains. And uh, there was a born to rule mentality that came out of the 50s and 60s. Life was easy, money would roll in the door and uh, all we needed was another war or we needed every Chinaman to wear another sock and the problem would be solved. And so there was a cargo cult mentality of someone else will fix this for me rather than I need to fix this for myself. And I, I think where we're at now with this issue of productivity gains is, I, I think the industry is a turning point. And uh, <clears throat> my view is that uh, the industry doesn't understand the need for productivity gains. And when I'm talking productivity gains, I'm not talking about producing more and more per hectare. It's not productivity. Productivity is the amount you produce in relation to the cost to produce it. So you can have higher value product, you can have less labour, you can have better quality pastures. There's a whole heap of ways you can address productivity. But um, the issue we have at the moment is that it's not even recognised as an issue in the sheep industry. And my view is that uh, that whether we're past the point or not, but we're very close to the point where if we don't recognise it and do something about it, it will be the end. And sheep will be run where you can't possibly run anything else and they won't be competitive. So this is the wool sector, not the meat sector. And while we continue to have uh, 
organisations like AWI that won't even acknowledge the need for productivity gains, let alone do anything about it, then I think we are doomed to be in a position of, of relative decline in competitiveness of sheep. Uh, and I'm talking wool sheep here, meat sheep is a different story. So there is a real challenge for this industry. Cotton industry at the moment, John Deere are making headers. The next generation of headers, uh, pickers, sorry. Tell I'm not a cotton farmer. <laughs> uh, the next generation of cotton pickers are being designed to pick 25 bales per hectare. Current yield, 12, 14 in a good year. They are, they are expecting to double the per hectare yields in the next 10 to 15 years and they're building machines to cope with that. What are we doing in the sheep industry to cope with productivity gains, to address and drive those productivity gains? Stuff all. We're relying on marketing and we've diverted our, our gaze completely from, from investing in R&D sensibly to achieve productivity gains and we're relying on someone else to fix the problem. So it's a bit of a rant and rave. It's, it's That's okay, uh, David. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it'll be uh, thought for discussion in the buzz section. I'm just going to take about two more questions. Um, we've just got one over here with Jeff. Thanks, David. Alana Roberts from ANZ in Wagga. Um, you touched briefly on return expectations back to your investors and projections you're putting to them. How has the last six or seven years affected those uh, projections and expectations and what role does capital gain have and the assumptions around capital gain? Um, well, as a, most of our investors are long term and, and long term I think it's quite um, justifiable to argue four to six percent operating yield in most enterprises if they're well run and you don't pay too much to buy the farm. Um, sure, they were pretty ordinary through the mid-2000s, um, but then in the last couple of years, you know, 10% has been achieved on quite a number of farms. Um, so four to six long-term average allowing for droughts and high prices, low prices, etc. Capital growth is, is a key part of it, and if you look at all the data the last 30 years, six to eight percent capital growth through uh, through high rainfall grazing and mixed farming regions has been pretty, pretty consistent. Not Sorry, not consistent, but it, that's what's been achieved. So obviously capital growth is a really important issue. Uh, it, it exceeds the return from operating yield. And it's ob obviously the operating yield puts the money in the bank in the short term, but we can't ignore the capital growth side of it. Okay, just one more question. Uh, Paul Lindley from the NAB in Wagga. David, where do you see then the returns regarding the price per hectare per acre of country now? I'd imagine in your game you're looking to get in lower because that's obviously going to drive your capital growth yep. over the longer term. But where do you see current prices now and uh, where do you see them in the future? Jeez, right. Going <laughs> <laughs> um, Prices now, well, you know, they've certainly come off in 10 to 20% in the last three years, more so in some areas than others. Probably the last 12 months there's been a bit of, uh, a, bit of a rise, but not a lot. Uh, the last three months there's been a bit of a rise in cropping country, which sort of staggers me that people buy, buy uh, long-term investments based on short-term price of commodities, but um, that seems to be the reality. Um, so we've been through a pretty stagnant period in the last five or six years, and I guess if you contrast that, say, with the US, there's been a 70% rise in the US in the same time in land values, and driven partly off corn and ethanol and a whole range of things, but the US land market's gone gangbusters in that time. I actually think it's interesting because we've had good commodity prices for the last three years or so, particularly in, in the lamb sector, but wool's been pretty good, beef's been good, and, and, and the cropping canola and wheat have been coming and going. And so the returns are bumped up, but we're not actually seeing that translated into increased activity or increased land value. I think it will come once balance sheets are repaired a little bit more. In the last couple of years have shown promise, but haven't quite got there. So I, I think uh, when farmers get a bit more cashed up, we'll see land values move again. By how much? I'm no way I'm prepared to predict that. Um, at the moment, I think there's good buying out there, but it's, it's not easy to find. Thanks, David. I know I said that was the last one, but we do have a very pleading face here, so very quickly. Thanks very much, David. Um, I uh, hear your 
intent for uh, economics as the driver. Do you see no room or, or would you like to quantify at all how much you think lifestyle should pl or may play in uh, driver of um, intent to farm? Well, you can have as much lifestyle as you want in there. Um, and, and obviously you've got to enjoy what you do and um, you, at the end of the day you also have to make a quit out of it, hopefully. So I don't, I don't have a problem with people having a major lifestyle component in their farming business. Um, no problem at all. I think it's a good thing. Um, I just think the more you go for a lifestyle component and you sacrifice profitability, if that means you sacrifice profitability in the process, the less right you've got to whinge when things go bad and the less right you have to expect the government to prop you up or do anything else because you've made a conscious decision to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to um, focus more on my lifestyle and I'll f I'm going to forego 100 grand of profit a year as a consequence of that. Now, no, you don't necessarily have to lose the profit in focusing on the lifestyle, but sometimes they do compromise like that. So, yes, it's an important component, but, uh, you know, you're a, you're a competitor out there and a whole heap of peer peers in the same sector and you have to make it work. Okay, thank you very much, David. Uh, thank you very much for taking the hot seat, hot seat first up today. I think you've, right. you've done really yeah. well. And thank you all for your questions. They were great questions and it's all about participation, as I said. We've now got five minutes for you to discuss on your own table the ideas that this session has provoked in your own mind, the potential questions or issues it raises for you and I just want you to have that little discussion now for five minutes before we move on to the next video.